Good evening and welcome back to our study. I want to thank everyone for praying for me. Uh, my pneumonia is gone and God's healing me, so thank you for your prayers. Also, we're back at Wednesday night, as, uh, as you know. Uh, we outgrew in the first night. We were back in it at uh, 119 St. Vincent. We outgrew it. It sat 48 and we had it over 70. And so we're looking for another venue. We have several ones that are coming up and we'll make sure that we let you know about that. But in the meantime, we're going to continue on Wednesday nights at 530. Sorry, we're a little late today. We're trying to get set back up. All right, let's go in the news and tell you what's happening there. As we go to uh, New World Order, this one came out today. Climate authoritarianism. World Economic Forum wants 75% fewer private cars. The climate change bond, uh, boondoggle acts as a mechanism for all kinds of social, economic, and political changes that could greatly diminish the freedom and financial survival of the average person, you and I. The vast majority of climate and carbon policies appear to be aimed at the West, at us. And this is one of the reasons why we know the claims behind them are fake. China alone counts for 32% of all carbon emissions on the planet, with the U.S. only uh, 10%, the EU around 8 Yet think tanks like the World Economic Forum and globalist havens like the UN are hyper-focused on the U.S. and Europe, while China does as it pleases. WEF Transportation Agenda demands that out of over 2 billion car owners, 1.5 billion people will lose the option of personal transportation. That would leave only 500 million people in the world with the privilege of owning a vehicle. Also keep in mind that the UN also wants to zero net carbon, carbon emissions by 2050, which means no more gas-powered vehicles in the next 25 years. By taking away people's cars, this forces the people into smaller and smaller areas where mass transportation is av available. Can you see what they're doing? They're huddling people together all over the world so that they can control them. And the truth is, and I'm not going to read all of it for you, but the truth is that only the super elite will be able to afford cars. So now you have a, a, another separation of the, of the masses, the people that are massed into one city or one locale who can't not only afford electric cars, but prohibited from buying any other type. And then the super rich and the elite, the authoritarians who can help afford those cars. It's really a, a terrible, terrible idea, but it's pushing mostly on the United States. Let me go a little bit further and tell you a little bit more what's going on. Shortage. Drug and food shortages are here and they will get a lot worse. A lot of experts th didn't think it would happen. Once the pandemic subsided, global supply chains were supposed to return to normal. But now hundreds of drugs are in short supply in the United States. And even CNN is admitting that we are in the midst of, quote, the worst food crisis in modern history. There have been shortages of many of our most basic antibiotics since last October. And now Pfizer is telling us that several types of penicillin will completely run out later this year. One survey, recent survey discovered that most cancer centers in the United States are reporting shortages of commonly used chemotherapy drugs. So let me tell you one other testimony before I get any further. Speaking of chemotherapy. So right after our study, three Thursdays ago, I went to MD Anderson. This is where I actually got sick on, on the flight there, but uh, for my cancer checkup. And praise the Lord, I have absolutely no cancer. I'm cancer free. So God is still continuing to work on my behalf. I just read chemotherapy and had to tell you that. So much of the current shortage stems from the, from the temporary closure of a drug manufacturing facility in India that happens to make our drugs, our, our chemo drugs. The FDA is using them. The question is, why in the world will we use, will we use India to, be, to, drug, to manufacture our drugs? Once the war between the U.S. and China starts, it's going to be exceedingly difficult to get things shipped across the Pacific. So what are, gonna, what are we going to do then? Already certain chemotherapy drugs are in short supply that some doctors are being forced to ration their care. That's horrific. In fact, the New York Times is telling us there's a shortage of hundreds of drugs in the United States right now. They're so acute that they are commanding the attention of the White House and Congress. According to Zero Hedge Phone, total global cocoa supplies, we are talk about food shortage, are becoming extremely tight, could push chocolate prices to dizzying heights. Not good for women. Cocoa prices have soared 44% over the last nine months to seven year highs. In addition, Zero Hedge is also reporting that there are very serious concerns about global supply levels of sugar and coffee. Now most of us can live without chocolate, sugar and coffee if we had to. But what about the basics? One food bank in southern Georgia is warning they're facing severe shortages of food and they're desperate for help. We're just, we're experiencing the biggest food shortage we haven't had in the last 40 years of food banking, CEO of Feeding the Valley Food Bank, Frank Shepard said. 
The winter wheat harvest in Kansas this year is going to be the smallest since 1957. U.S. corn prices are expected to soar because the corn belt is being hit by the worst drought in 30 years. The size of the U.S. beef cow herd has fallen to the lowest since 1962. The orange harvest in Florida in 2023 will be approximately 56% smaller than it was in 2022. Approximately 90% of Georgia's peach crop this year has been wiped out. On top of everything else, now millions of Mormon crickets have invaded Nevada and they're eating everything in in sight, excuse me. And of course, all this is happening in the context of a horrific global food crisis. According to one report, the number of people around the globe that are facing acute food insecurity increased a whopping 34% last year. A global famine has begun and it will eventually get a lot worse. If you've not been preparing for such a scenario, I strongly suggest you get started. These are the signs of the times. This is what's happening. This is what we know Matthew 24 tells us. We are watching it all around us. But don't fear. The Bible says when we see these things, look up because our redemption draws nigh. Let me give you a little bit more about Israel. And let me tell you this in short. Mainstream churches are pushing evangelicals to be less supportive of Israel. That's right. A concerted effort is underway by some mainstream churches to convince evangelical Christians to be less supportive of Israel. The... uh, the incoming head of the evangelical organization headquartered in Jerusalem says, the big churches are using a very loud voice to malign, fabricate, and twist the story to make Israel look like a human rights violator and an oppressor of faith. So Christianity in Israel is growing, as a matter of fact, and it's protected in Israel. While elsewhere in the Middle East, it's oppressed, shrinking, ver- uh, vulnerable, or, or leaving. But public opinion polls have shown a dramatic drop in support for Israel among young evangelicals in recent years, millennials. And so basically, you know the story. You know what I've told you. We are losing young people, Christian people, to secular humanism. They're believing our culture. They're believing anything the culture throws at them, Christians. And basically, they're missing a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And so Israel right now still stands strong. I'm concerned about America and the West and what we're teaching in our churches. How about war? And this one, Xi Jinping is preparing China for a war with the United States. We're hearing it over and over again. Here's what this article says. He has made, he wants unification with Taiwan, one of his top important foreign policy. By the way, if he does that, he'll be a tremendous hero in China. And if he does it, he'll drag us into a war because they're an ally, Taiwan, and we have a lot of products that come from them. He'll drag us into war. And he also knows this. He has a year and a half to do this. Why do I say that? because Biden will not use nuclear weapons if we went to war. On the other hand, he knows that if a Republican comes into office or a GOP in the president or Donald Trump, they will use nuclear weapons. And so he has only about a year and a half window with Biden being there. And so basically right now we know that he's gonna push as much as he can. They're already doing exercises. And again, I'm just giving you a summation what this says. They're already doing exercises, large number of military aircraft and putting them into air, Taiwan's airspace. Matter of fact, Taiwan News reports that America has increased its presence to about 200 troops on the island. The Biden administration keeps taking steps to aggravate China, and the Chinese keep taking steps to aggravate the Biden administration. At some point, China will be pushed over the edge. As long as the war doesn't go nuclear, the Chinese know that they would have the advantage. All the tests, all the runs show that they will. And our leaders know that the Chinese would have the advantage. But Joe Biden is not going to start lobbing nukes at the Chinese mainland in order to keep them out of Taiwan. It's just not going to happen. So there's a window of opportunity, as I said, for Chinese President Xi Jinping to do something that he desperately wants to do. Until the next presidential election in the United States, he has a chance to grab Taiwan. Now let's go on a little bit further and tell you about religion. This article came out today. How did the LGBTQ movement steal the biblical rainbow? The rainbow is a promise from God. The rainbow all through Genesis is a promise from God. But in 1970, when San Francisco artist and drag performer Gilbert Baker was asked to create a symbol representing the gay community, he took the rainbow, he stole the rainbow. Since his creation of the rainbow uh, pride flag, Gilbert has been recognized by political leaders and praised for the studies he made in the movement in 2016. Former President Barack Obama presented Baker with a hand-dyed rainbow flag. With June being designated Pride Month, the LGBT community and supporters push the sale as much as the rainbow gear as possible. The rainbow is and always will be a sign of the covenant God made with his people. The woke 
mob try to, may try to twist its meaning, but we won't let their foolishness prevail. It's time to reclaim the rainbow for God's purpose. In Genesis 6, we're told that the human population grew, and so did their wickedness. Humans were so corrupt that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were evil all the time. Genesis 6, 5. From the beginning of time, fleshly desires took over the human race, and people turned their back on God. So God sent a great flood in order to put an end to all people. Genesis 6, 13. Except for one family, headed by a man named Noah. God ordered Noah to build a ark and spare him from his family from the flood. Genesis 9, 11. He established his promise saying this, Never again will all life be destroyed <clears throat> by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. To seal his promise, God explained the significance and the symbol of his, co of his covenant. I have set a rainbow in the clouds. I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Genesis 9.13 If the original meaning of the rainbow was meant to represent God's promise to never wipe out people with a flood again, how come it's now associated with the sexual orientation and gender fluidity? Doesn't it seem ironic that a movement rooted in sexual anarchy, which stands in opposition to the word of God, uses a biblical symbol to represent its anti-biblical ideology? As Christians, the rainbow represents something completely different and much more sacred of a symbol of hope. It seems significant that the LGBTQ rainbow is a counterfeit of a real rainbow because everything about the sexual revolution is a counterfeit of the good things God created. Satan always does that. As we walk through the month of June, we need to heed the instruction of Peter when he wrote to God's elect and remember to stand firm in our faith and convictions. He says, but you are chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own purpose, that you may proclaim, that's the word there, the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, First Peter. If you have an opportunity and somebody tells you about the rainbow, make sure you proclaim that the rainbow is ours, not some LGBTQ uh, queer person that invented it. Let me give you a little more. AI and religion, this is shocking. A new AI religion and a new AI Bible. With will millions of people soon be looking to artificial intelligence for spiritual guidance? Such a nation should sound, could sound notion should sound crazy to you, but we should not underestimate how rapidly AI is changing our world. Chat GPT is capable of doing a whole bunch of things. In just a matter of moments, it can produce extremely sophisticated answers to very complex questions. Of course, what we're seeing right now is just the beginning. AI technology is advancing at an ex exponential rate, and given enough time, it, will, it would be millions of times more powerful than it is right now. This sort of technology has the potential to take over every aspect of our lives. Sadly, it also includes religion. On this past Friday, over 300 people attended a church service, in quotations, that was led by a chat GPT chat box. The artificial intelligence chat box asked the believers in the fully packed St. Paul's Church in the Bavarian time of Thurth to rise from the pews and praise the Lord. The chat GPT chat box personified by an avatar of a bearded black man on a huge screen above the altar then began preaching to more than 300 people who had shown up on Friday morning for an experimental Lutheran church service almost entirely generated by AI. During the 40 minute service, four different avatars appeared on the screen. Two of them were young women, two of them were young men. 98% of the content for the service comes from the machine. AI made the sermon. In this case, ChatGPT was asked to contribute to a Christian worship service, and it was definitely very creepy. But of course, it's probably just a matter of time before entirely new religions are created by artificial intelligence. Like a one world religion, remember Revelation? The world is on the verge of a new religion created by artificial intelligence. The historian Yuval Noah Haraya has claimed, the academic, known for his best-selling book, Sapiens, said software such as ChatGPT could attract worshipers by writing its own sacred texts. Speaking at a science conference, he said AI has crossed a new frontier by gaining mastery of our language and is now capable of using it to shape human culture. You and I may think that this is a load of nonsense, but the truth is that there are millions of people out there that already believe some really strange things. For example, this week, uh, something called the Church of Silomethoxin already has several hundred followers. A motley assemblage of army veterans, yogis, and psychonauts are mingling in April in the garden of a luxury property just outside Austin, Texas. 
on the hottest day of the year, yet in the state, some 350 people were there to dance to ambient music and celebrate a unique religious uh, converse, congregation that worships the psychedelic sacrament, one they claim to have created themselves by crossbreeding magic mushrooms with hallucinogenic toad venom. Welcome to the church of Silomethoxin. Yuval Noah Harare believes that AI could even be used to write a new Bible. He dropped the bomb when he said this, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. He added that throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity, and that in a few years there might be a religious, religions that are actually going to do it. Just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. That could really be a reality in a very few, few, few years. If millions of people around the globe started looking at to a superhuman intelligence to shape their core beliefs, the potential for abuse would be off the charts. Whoever was in, tr in control, let's talk about Antichrist, of that superhuman intelligence would potentially have an army of adherents ready and willing to do whatever they were commanded. Remember, some of the best, some of the worst wars in the, on the world were fought for religion. In the wrong hands, such technology could result in death and destruction on an epic scale. Last month, a group of AI scientists signed a statement warning about, quote, the risk of extinction of mankind from AI, but it was almost entirely ignored by the mainstream media. This statement made headlines around the world, with many media reporting, reports suggesting that experts now believe AI could lead to human extinction, to quote a CNN article. But will we ever get to that stage? Well, we're moving into times that would truly look like something out of a science fiction movie, or out of something from Revelation. And I would suggest, for the mankind, it's not good news at all. Let's go a little bit further. We talk about religion. The progressive war against fatherhood, marriage, and family. Father's Day is a good time to reflect on the importance of dads. It's also an opportunity to bring attention to how fatherhood, marriage, and family became divisive, partisan politic, political issues to the progressive left. And here's the kicker. As a candidate and president, Barack Obama talked about often about the importance of fatherhood, marriage, and family. A speech he gave in Chicago 10 years ago about violent crime included one observation he made that, that few Democrats would repeat publicly today. He said, quote, there is no more important ingredient for success than strong, stable families, which means we should do more to promote marriage and encourage fatherhood. <coughs> Excuse me. The loudest criticism Obama received for elevating fathers came from his progressive supporters. The rest of the party took notice. Democrats then removed all references to fatherhood from the 2016 and 2020 party platforms. That's why Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was criticized for signing a bill in April that will provide $70 million for programs to promote responsible fatherhood. Uh, actually, Tony Dungy, a Hall of Fame NFL coach and pro-family advocate, was there to defend himself by simply appearing with the governor at the event announcing the new law. Children have a right to the love and support of the men and women who created them. A frequently cited Centers for Disease Control and Prevention study on fathers' involvement found that only 8% of fathers who lived apart from their young children ate with them every day, while 43% said they didn't eat with their kids at all. By contrast, 72% of dads who lived with their children, who lived with them, ate meals with them every day. Research on fathers proves it's virtually impossible to encourage responsible fatherhood without talking about marriage. Research shows 97% of millennials born between 1980 and 1984 who finished school, secure employment, and married before having children are financially secure by the mid-30s. Those goals are tangible and those goals are achievable and measurable because they have fathers. Fathers matter, whatever their color, whatever their religion or political views. That's why defending marriage and family shouldn't be a partisan matter. That's why you're seeing the, the extreme left and actually and the Democrats try to tear apart families and fatherhood. Why? Because Satan hates the nuclear family. He knows it's the strength of a nation. Conservatives need to continue to promote the view that children have the best social and emotional outcomes when they're raised in a home with a married mother and a married father. Speaking about a, a, a uh, administration that's gone absolutely wild, look at this picture. Look at the two American flags and the gay flag in the middle. That is against the flag code of America. American flag code says that the, our flag must fly in the middle of any other flags and it must be elevated above them. 
But Biden, in his arrogance, uh, has decided to go against the American flag code and do this. People visiting Washington, D.C. last weekend probably expected to see a White House on Pennsylvania Avenue. Instead, the president's residence was plastered in rainbow and transgender colors, an over-the-top display of the current resident's LGBT fixation. It was a stark contrast to the mood in the rest of America, where the fury, where the flurry over pride displays have reached a deafening roar. Americans are sick of it. They've had it. That all seems lost on Joe Biden, though, who hosted the largest pride event in White House history on Saturday. In a scripted response to a PBS reporter, it was scripted, the president up un unloaded on parents who are up in arms about the indoctrination of their sons and daughters, calling the opposition to child mutilation hysterical and cruel. Listen, Joe Biden, you're hysterical and you are, you are not smart at all. You are actually bordering on the edge of stupid if you think that we're going to believe and take what you're saying. PBS News White House correspondent Lori Barden Lopez framed the conversation this way. She said this, a pro-Biden. All over the country, Republicans-led states are passing laws, passing anti-LGBT and anti-transgender laws that restrict rights and medical care. Intimidation, she says, is on the rise. This week, anti-LGBTQ protesters turned violent in, in, in California. She claimed to have spoken to parents who are considering leaving the United States because local governments are cracking down on barbaric child sex change procedures. She then asked Biden, what do you think is happening and what do you say to parents like I spoke to who want to leave the country because all over the all over the country there are laws against trans trans people the president replied by proudly ticking through all of his LGBT activism like throwing open the military to people who identify as the opposite sex signing the sweeping same-sex marriage law earlier this year but he pivoted he said our fight is far far from over because we have some hysterical and I would argue prejudiced people who are engaged in all that you see going on in the country it's an appeal to fear. It's an appeal that is totally, thoroughly unjustified and ugly. What's going on? Well, um, well, Americans are not standing for it. In our states, we're passing laws against this horrific onslaught by LGBTQ and the mutilation of children. And Biden's ticked about it. And so is the LGBTQ community. He says it's wrong, Biden ranted, that extreme GOP officials are pushing hateful bills. They're not hateful. They're, no they're, they're natural. They're normal. They're, they're, sa they're sane. Targeting transgender children, terrifying families, and criminalizing doctors. And then he says this, these are our kids. I got news for Biden. Our American kids are not your kids. He says these are our neighbors. It's cruel, he says. It's callous. They're not somebody else's kids. Of course they are. He says there are there are kids. No, they're not. What kind of fairy tale is he this guy living in? Outraged Republicans like Rep Representative Richard McCormick, Republican from Georgia, fired back. He said, contrary to President Biden, the nation's children do not belong to him. And it's good to oppose unnecessary and irreversible medical procedures for kids. If Joe Biden wants to see an, see an extremist, there are mirrors all over the White House. Other conservatives can't understand why the president is leaning into an issue that sparked such a nationwide uprising. Even last week, listen to this, polling showed just how far outside the mainstream the Democratic Party is when it comes to this hot-button debate. Now, this is alarming. You need to hear it. Uh, an astonishing 71% of Americans reject Biden's suggestion that there are more than two genders in the latest Rasmussen report, including 67% of his own party. <laughs> you know what I say? I think that Biden's backward logic is great. I think he needs to keep pushing it. I think he needs to push it as much as he possibly can because he's going to push himself right out of the White House. And this is not accepted by the American people. In the meantime, Biden's flagrant allegation, allegiance, excuse me, to the LGBT prog progress flag is not only putting him at odds with the most Americans, but potentially, critics argue, with the U.S. flag code. Flag in the United States of America should be at the center and at the highest point of the group when a number of flags of states or localities or pendants or societies are grouped and displayed from staffs. That's Judicial Watch, uh, Tom Fulton said. More than that, he insisted, to advance revolutionary transgender agenda targeting children, Biden disrespects every single American service member buried under its colors. And again, good. I hope he continues with this stupid, self-influencing LGBT nonsense. We can boycott him as much as we boycott Bud Light, Target, and Chick-fil-A. When he runs for office again, he'll run into 71% of Americans who disagree with his absolute stupid administration. Let me, that, I say, let them self-destruct. Out of, listen, he can attend any gay trans event he wants once he's out of office. He can do it now, but we're gonna, we're gonna vote him out, absolutely. 
Let me give you this one, speaking about it. This is a fire that happened in, a, in, a, in Boston. Social media posts linking Massachusetts church fire to gay weddings. This article says they're false. Boone found that the fire occurred to natural, due to natural causes and there were no gay marriage happening in a church at that time. So what happened was somebody got on Twitter and said this happened because of gay marriages in the church. And Boone comes and says, that's not true. Well, let me tell you the truth. The truth is this did happen and this church is noted for its, its LGBTQ stance, pro stance. And yes, they are very, very vocal about their stance. This article goes on to say that the fire gutted the church in Boston on the 3rd of June. Uh, suddenly a powerful lightning struck this church, which immediately caught f uncontrollable fire despite having lightning conductors. This church was famous for LGBTQ plus pride, and most, most gays traveled to, to wed there. Um, amazingly, no single firefighting truck was able to reach it to extinguish the fire before it completely took the church over. Surely heavens have had enough of this gay nonsense. So they may say it's about lightning, but let me tell you something. Lightning, secularists and insurance companies call an act of God. So even if it was lightning, that is still an act of God. And yes, I am excited to see things like this happen. These churches don't belong standing. We, we're either going to support Christ we're going to support every cultural aberration that comes along. Let me go a little bit further. And man, I'm ticked off tonight, and I'm excited tonight because I think th things are starting to turn, and I'm very excited about that. This one, the coming brain chip. Uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink company just received approval from the U.S. Drug and, and Food and Drug Administration to study the effects of this new technology in human subjects. The tech firm intends to implant microchips in the brain to address certain health conditions such as paralysis and blindness and to enable access to computers by the disabled. Some instances of this technology are already working. Recently, a 40-year-old Dutch man who was paralyzed in a cycling accident 12 years ago received implants which helped him re regain his ability to walk. And how, how, however that good that sounds, listen to the other side. There's concern about where this technology is headed. A director of the Information Commission's office in the UK recently noted, quote, neurotechnology collects intimate personal information that people are often not aware of including emotions and complex behaviors. The consequences could be dire if these technologies are developed or deployed inappropriately. Yet through Neuralink, Elon Musk is hoping that his company's implants will become a general population device with the potential to serve as a backup drive for your non-physical being, your digital soul. That's a quote. Humans have long desired to play God, not unlike Satan, the devil, who tried to usurp God's throne. Isaiah tells us that. While this neurotechnology may allow mankind to cure previously incurable diseases, and that may sound good, human beings need to be careful about assuming God-like prerogatives because there is, there is a real God. The scripture record that God intervened powerfully at the Tower of Babel to stop the direction that the godless society was going and limit humans' capabilities, Genesis 11, 1 to 6. Few today in our increasingly secular world sufficiently recognize the danger of allowing our technical growth to outpace our moral capacity to wield new, new technologies in an ethical way. In the news is kind of shocking at times. I do want to bring it to you because I want you to be alerted. Very rarely do I bring you any good news, but I want to bring you good news tonight as we close in the news. Good news from Iran. A million new Christian believers. What first comes to your mind when you hear the word Iran in the headlines? Some of us immediately reflect on the Islamic Republic of Iran's restlessness and their relentless efforts to develop a nuclear weapon while their government-sponsored mobs chant death to America or death to Israel. For others, it's Iran's relentless military aggression in the Middle East and assassination squads elsewhere. Meanwhile, those of us who focus on international religious freedom recall that year after year, Iran is listed as one of the 10 worst persecutors of Christians in the world. But there's another story that isn't widely reported on our American news media. Amazingly, there's an explosive number of conversions to Christianity taking place in Iran. This is an absolutely amazing article. Something religiously astonishing is taking place in Iran, where an Islamic government has ruled since 1979. Christianity is flourishing. The implications are potentially profound. One Iranian journalist writes this, Iranians have become the most open people to the gospel in the entire world. One poll shows that Christianity is growing faster in the Islamic Republic of Iran than in any other country worldwide. This trend results from the extreme form of Shiite Shia Islam opposed by the theocratic regime. An Iranian church leader explained in 2019, what if I told you, he said, the mosques are empty inside Iran? What if I told you no one follows 
Islam inside of Iran. What if I told you the best evangelist for Jesus was the Ayatollah Khomeini? Why would he say that? Because he founded the Islamic Republic and made Shiite law and drove people away from Islam. Confirming these statements, a significant survey taken in 2020 by Gaman, a secular Netherlands-based research group, reported there are far greater numbers of Christian believers in Iran than ever before, more than a million. In fact, those involved with the house church movement in Iran are convinced that there are likely several million Christian believers there. New Christian witnesses to others is mostly shared in quiet conversations, encouraged by low-profile online Bible studies, and affirmed by visions, dreams, and miraculously answered prayers. <coughs> Excuse me, the article goes on to say this. What happens is they're meeting in, in houses. Sometimes no more than 10 to 15. They come in quietly. They have to come in quietly. They sing quietly. They play guitars quietly. They worship quietly. They study the Bible quietly. And then they get excited because they go out and they tell all their neighbors. And basically what happens is when the government finds out about any of these house churches, which there's literally hundreds of thousands of house churches, they will crack down as much as they can. They'll rape the women. They'll rape the children. Or they'll rape the girls. They'll rape the parents. They'll throw people in prison. But in spite of all that, these Iranian Christians are continuing to worship and gather. It's almost like a, a rolling stone that's continuing to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Nothing the government's doing. Nothing the Islamic Shiite government is doing. No persecution is stopping them. It's only making them get stronger. One estimate is that they have more than 2.5 million Christians in Iran and it's growing and they're all reading the Bible for the first time praying gathering in small groups sharing the new faith with friends and family despite the risks their faith is absolutely amazing it's encouraging it's inspiring today when we see Iran in the headlines we're wise to be concerned let's pray for God's intervention into the regime's deadly intentions but let's also remember that our little known but rapidly growing Christian family inside Iran's borders their bold example of courage in the face of persecution shines brightly amid the ever-increasing darkness in the Middle East. One report I read said this, Iranians are getting saved, and watch this, by one of the greatest evangelists you and I ever know, Jesus himself. He's appearing at, their, at the foot of their beds at night. He's leading people to himself miraculously. They're getting prayers answered. I get chills thinking about it. Iran is on fire with the gospel. And that is so exciting to me because no matter how much the enemy tries to stamp us out, no matter how much the church of God will prevail, the church of God will, the church will never lose its power. <coughs> that's in the news for tonight. Again, excuse me, my coughing, that's bronchitis, that's going to go away soon. <coughs>